Conor McGregor, John Anik, Daniel Cormier, Michael Chandler, Francis Ngannou, and I. Is it I or me? And I are all in a predicament together that would be I. Do you know the difference in I and me? It's very important that you learn that or you sound stupid. I, here's the situation. I read things that Anik said, and Anik, every time he speaks, if you know Anik, can set things down on accident. Because Anik would never reveal inside information. The problem is Anik's on the inside and all the information he gets is inside information. So he has a way that he has to present to the world without letting them in on something that he was in a room and heard, right? I mean, it's just an interesting spot. Daniel Cormier isn't overly different. He is different, right? Anik is in a little bit more, but Daniel's around. And so when they both speak, you got to be looking for their tails. You got to be looking for their, their, their poker hands. Both of them spoke yesterday about Conor McGregor and the fight with Michael Chandler, which is the same thing I spoke about yesterday. And the three of us all, John Anik, Daniel Cormier, and I have come to the same conclusion that Francis Ngannou made a mistake, that Conor McGregor and Red Panty Knight is still the biggest thing in MMA. Francis Ngannou was injured and is going to sit out a minimum of until 2024. Conor McGregor, who was injured, is going to sit out to a minimum of 2024. This was a bad decision by Francis Ngannou. It was a good decision for Conor McGregor. How do we get there? Because I did it too. I have a feeling you guys have done it. How do we get there? How is Francis, who later in life and dealing with a very serious leg injury, appearing to only be partway into this sport because he's talking about a different sport. Oh, by the way, he's going to return in a different calendar year, and those are all negatives, but that exact same thing is the ingredients that you have in a pot, and you stir it up, and out comes a Conor McGregor. How do we get there? That I don't know. I mean, I will share with you that is open and blatant biasness. Is it biasness to a character or to an athlete? Is it biasness to an organization or an idea? I don't know. But I feel that I have successfully proven that we do have a bias, don't we? And it feels right, even in light of the hypocrisy that I just stated, it feels right. I think it was a bad move for Francis. I think it was a good move for Connor. Right? We're in one of these really weird paradoxes. I think that Francis's spot is colossally difficult because of the opponent. There is far more likely possible and even probable opponents for Francis that are going to be a massive exhale. Ugh. There are far more names that can be drawn from a hat and stand opposite Francis and Gano for his debut that is going to suck the air out of the balloon and go, you got to be kidding me. Hunter McGregor, any name in multiple different weight classes, at any weight class they decide to make up is going to be huge business. It's just the way that it is. It's just the spot that he's in. So, the Connor situation is very tough for me. And it's tough for me on a personal aspect. And I don't want to get too into personal things about Michael Chandler, but Michael Chandler has let you, the audience, into his private life, into fatherhood, into, as of about a year ago, multiple fatherhood, and his wife, and his home, and what he does for training, the fact that he has to pack up, and he has to leave home to prepare for matches, and leave this beautiful family behind him, and I just share for you that 
when dad is a prize fighter and he's got to do it on the road, he deserves a prize. He just does. When he goes and puts a full day's work in, he deserves a prize. Whether that's every Friday at five or that's the conclusion of every contest. And to have Chandler going through some of these things and not see a prize. Let me tell you guys a story. I had a dog. Rest his soul. Had to put him down three weeks ago. Oh, my goodness. However hard you think that is going to be, however hard you envision that being, exponentially more difficult of a thing to go through. But this little guy, it was as though he didn't speak any English. You know, most dogs, you, you can get dogs, you know, 10 to 12, really sharp dogs. You can get up to 17, 18 commands. And my dog, Danger, it was as though, I mean, it didn't matter what I said to him. He would look at me, and he'd have the beautiful eyes, and he'd turn his head. And he was trying to listen. He just could never figure out what I was. I had to give him a treat anyway. I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't uh, kettle up to get into my pickup truck. He couldn't get down to, when he was on furniture that it wasn't supposed to be. He couldn't come. He couldn't stay. He couldn't fetch. It was one of these things, and I'd work with him and work with him, but he was just going to do something different, and not because he was a bad dog. It's just it was like he had never heard the word before, even though I'd say it day after day. I bring this to you because my wife, Brittany, at times going, hey, you're not spending enough time with him. You're obviously not training him correctly. So we go to the pros. Go to the pros. This guy comes in. He picks him up. Going to keep him for three weeks. Takes him out to a place called Salvi's Island, which you can even look up. They're, they're very well known for dog training out this part of the world. Bring my dog back. And the dog didn't understand a word. He did not understand stit. He did not understand come. He did not understand stay. So it got to where the dog would be doing something, and whatever it was he was doing, I would tell him to do that. By example, if I saw him chewing on a, a cushion from the couch, and my wife would come in, and, oh my goodness, another cushion is getting destroyed. I would look over at Danger, and I would say, chew on that couch cushion. And then I would say, oh, good boy. Or if Danger came up to me, for whatever reason, just on his own, he would come up to me. I would then say, come. Or if I saw his back knees bending where he was going to start to sit down, I would say, sit. And it, so it was as though, right? It was a joke in the house as though he was perfectly trained, as though he was doing what I was telling him to do. If he'd be in the process of barking for no ungodly reason at all, I would say, bark, speak. And I got a great laugh. Everybody thought this was really funny. I'm starting to think that would be a great troll by Michael Chandler to Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor continues to do whatever it is he wants. And it sounds as though everybody is going to acquiesce. I have told you guys a million times, and I will tell you a million and one, the United States Anti-Doping Agency could walk right up to Conor McGregor and ask him for a test right now. He does not need to be in the pool. And there is very clear and objective language for what happens if he is to refuse that test. Now, where that wants to go, who wants to actually arbitrate that, but I'm sharing for you. USADA, who operates at the discretion of the United States Senate on taxpayer dollars, and don't tell me about the 10.4 from the UFC. I understand that a private business has now gone after them too. I'm sharing with you, has the ability to go and test Connor now when they haven't done it? They're scared, period. They are scared of what would happen. They are scared of the pushback that somebody that isn't going to lay down and get kicked and walked on, which is all they've ever gone after their whole life. They've only ever gone after people that can't punch back. And they are scared to do it to Connor. Now, I don't care. I'm sharing with you that when we make the statement, Connor will do as Connor pleases. It even extends to them. So, I don't know if Connor's going to fight Chandler. I know at one point he said he would. 
I also don't know that there's a method to the madness of Conor McGregor, but I can sit back and I can observe his trends. And I can see them working so well over such a long period of time that one could deduce it's strategic. Let me talk about Anderson Silva. Anderson Silva's recipe to promote a fight. And nobody ever caught on to this, and perhaps I only caught on because I studied this guy so closely. But the way Anderson would promote a fight, every single fight, rinse and repeat, is wait until the opponent is found, let the media build, get the promotion to say that's the direction they're going, get the media, get responses from this opponent. Once that dies down and is no longer a headline, Anderson will come out and he'll refuse the fight. He'll say, no, I'm not going to fight him for whatever reason. And he would get about two weeks of media, about two weeks of headlines over the refusal of the match, at which point when those died down, he would then accept. So now he's accepted the fight, and you've got these headlines, you've got his interviews and the other guy, and you're going back and forth, you're looking for dates and locations. And at some point prior to the fight, Anderson would put out a rumor through his camp that he was injured. He personally wouldn't do it. And he personally would not confirm it, but he also personally would not deny it. So now the speculation runs rampant that Anderson has heard and the fight isn't going to happen, and then he would go into the fight. But it was the same thing each time. That was his recipe. Connor has a similar recipe. And one thing that Connor will do once he builds interest and looks like he's coming for you Looks like he's chosen you. One piece of that, and I'm going to fast forward, but one piece towards the end of the trajectory every time is Connor will move on and he'll never tell you. Connor's the boyfriend who began dating another girl and never break up with you. You will be the last to know and you feel like a fool and you'll be standing there with your head down as he walks into the dance with a dime piece on his arm. That's just the way he does it. So what if you did it back to him? What if you did it to, not an ultimatum, not telling him you have until this date or else, not signed by Friday at five or else, don't say anything to him because he wouldn't say it to you. What if out of nowhere you went and called out someone else? I mean, what would happen? Eddie Alvarez called out Michael Chandler yesterday, which would make for the greatest trilogy that I can personally think of. In fact, I'd put that at number one. I would put Stipe and Engano at number two. That's how important I believe that it would be to our industry that Eddie Alvarez and Michael Chandler finish this, because it's not finished. It's one apiece. But what would happen if Chandler came out and accepted that? What if he went for it? What if? Eddie's free, just so you understand. I thought Eddie was with Bare Knuckle Boxing. You're right, but Bare Knuckle Boxing will allow Eddie to go and do MMA for an organization, in this case, if it was the UFC. Dave Feldman's been very open about that. So what would happen if Chandler started to go in that direction? You would assume that that now means his business with McGregor is done. Okay, so what, right? You might think, okay, so what? Connor's done that a hundred times with no repercussion. And he's left people looking like fools. Every single time there was a pay-per-view within a 20-pound radius, it could be 135, 145, or 155, but if there was a pay-per-view where there was a feature match at any one of those weight classes, Conor McGregor would take to Twitter and call that person out. He would congratulate them and tell them how good they looked and then say, but you wouldn't do that with me. I'll see you soon. Something along this effect. And it would be seen by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And that person would be excited and their parents would be giving them high fives and hugs and pats on the head. And Connor would drop them without even a conversation and he would move on to somebody else. For years, he did that. So what would happen if Michael Chandler came out and accepted Eddie Alvarez's invitation? Which do you think is harder to do? To get Eddie Alvarez, a notoriously clean fighter, with no injuries and no excuses that has one hell of a backstory, and isn't going to come in and try to binge over and take the whole bank. He's going to make sure there's enough on the table that everybody 
get spread around. Or Conor McGregor, who has been given the opportunity, has been brought to U.S. soil and for reasons unknown cannot do his paperwork. There is paperwork within USADA. That's true. I could get my phone out, though, right now. I could do it online, and I could be done in 15 minutes, and I could be part of the USADA pool, just so you know. But I would have to spend those 15 minutes. So, I'm wondering what kind of a troll and what kind of a move would need to be done on Conor McGregor to get him to jump. And what bad would come from Michael Chandler accepting a challenge from Eddie Alvarez. And we're only in the headline business. We're not in anything else. So if you think you're getting traction, right? If you're a Michael Chandler spot and you're getting traction each week with Connor, even if it looks less and less likely like that fight is going to happen, but it stays in the headlines, stay right where you are. But if those headlines begin to die down or those headlines begin to shift, and Connor's the one that shifted them because he started to look for a new opponent as he's done to people for three years. Wouldn't it be better if you were the one that found the opponent first, that you shifted the headlines first? And if Eddie was to call out, or I apologize, Chandler was to accept the call out from Eddie just by example, purely by example am I bringing these two together, what's the media going to do? It can't turn to Chandler, hey, is the fight with Connor going to happen? Yeah, gee, I think so. I've been telling you that for eight months. It can't turn to Connor and say, that. Ah, yeah, no, I'm trying to get my paperwork done with USADA. Sure is, sure is hard to come up with these 15 minutes needed. Eventually, they're going to have to turn it back on the promotion. They're going to say, hey, what's going on here? This sounds like a really great, captivating fight between two warriors that the fans would like to see. That sounds very reasonable. It sounds like something the organization is looking for on a regular basis. And it seems as though that's the spot that we're going to get to eventually. So if the dog won't listen to you, you can look like a fool and you can just keep throwing the stick. You could. Or you could tell the dog in front of an audience, stay right there, don't move. Throw the stick. Let it land. Dog's right there. You look like a genius.